this, in effect, it covers 50 years. 50 years ago, I was at Cambridge, so I qualify as a Paleo-Keynesian. Uh, back in the uh, in, in studying, doing my doctorate for Richard Kahn, and returned to Cambridge after a 35-year sabbatical uh, in 2007, just in time for economics to become a really interesting subject again, thanks to 2008. At that point in time, I discovered, to my delight, that at Cambridge there was a core group of economists who looked in 2008 as an opportunity, not a threat. And in response to a question, over the course of about a year, they generated a coherent consensus research agenda, which INET, as you will hear, has partnered to back and support, as a result of which, embedded in the economics faculty at Cambridge, the Cambridge INET Institute has been an, er an, an, an agent, an engine, for the resurgence of economics renewing why Anatole Koletsky, a Cambridge man as well, had set the first plenary conference of INET at King's College, Cambridge, as you all have heard and know, John Maynard Keynes' college. So with that, I'm going to introduce Sanjeev Goyal, chair of the faculty, who will give you an overview of the foundation and the contributions that INET has been making at Cambridge and why Cambridge INET is now a jewel in the crown of INET. Thank you, Bill. Um, can you hear me? OK, good. Let me see if this works. OK, good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I have about uh, seven, eight minutes. So uh, what I would like to do is to uh, give you a very, very brief and a very high level um, sense of how um, the collaboration between INET and uh, New York and, and the Faculty of Economics in Cambridge is um, in some ways you know, a, a marriage that I think has worked very well so far, unlike the marriage between the Germans and the Euro and, and some other marriages that we were talking about earlier. And so I'm looking forward to many more years of happy sort of married life. Uh, let me start by saying, as I think uh, for those of us in this hall who are not from Cambridge, um, just to set the context of how it came about that this has worked so well. Um, so Cambridge is, um, in my view, probably one of the first places after Edinburgh, of course, where economics really took root, and, and I think uh, Malthus was mentioned here uh, earlier on uh, in, in this afternoon. So Thomas Malthus was an, an early economist in, uh, trained at Jesus College in, in Cambridge. And, and of course, after that, through the late 19th century and the 20th century, we've had uh, a great many people. Um, and there are some names that I've put on the slide, but you can, you can definitely add to that list uh, a number of other people, depending on your taste and, you know, uh, what I do want to uh, highlight in this, in this sort of in this uh, uh, in the forum here is, um, and for me that's been important as chair of the faculty. It's also been important uh, as the founding director of Cambridge INET, is that there has been and there remains a radical spirit in in Cambridge, uh, and I think it goes back uh, a long way. Uh, probably it goes back to the founding of Cambridge after Oxford, uh, but it, certainly in economics, it, it's very well reflected in, uh, I think, what Keynes did to the classical orthodoxy, the, the notion of Say's law, uh, and, and I think it has been very much, um, I think, the spirit of the faculty since then, and I'm just mentioning some names here, which I think all of you must be uh, are, are must be familiar to all of you, uh, there's Keynes, but also Joan Robinson uh, and, and, and her student, Amartya Sen, who's been a major uh, spirit you know, with, with, with INET. Um, he studied in, in Cambridge in the 50s, 60s, and has been associated with the university and for a very long time. So in 2012, really, as Bill said, after the inaugural conference of INET in, in, in 
at King's College, there was um, uh, mediated to, to a great extent by Bill, there were discussions between INET New York and the faculty, and uh, we, some of us found ourselves in a very, very fortunate moment in time, and as Bill likes to say, the crisis was very bad news for the world, but probably it was very good for the profession of economics. And, and I think certainly it was very good for the faculty of economics in Cambridge. Uh, what we did was we were able to get together and get going and have a conversation with Bill and Rob and others at INET and within the faculty uh, to uh, set up the Cambridge INET Institute. Uh, and what I just want to do in the remaining five or six minutes for me is to give you a very, very um, quick uh, sort of overview of how I think uh, the Cambridge INET Institute has revitalized the faculty uh, and fundamentally revitalized the faculty. And uh, it has done so by bringing outstanding researchers and students to engage with questions that have come to the fore uh, with INET taking center stage following on the crises of 2008, but also the ongoing events after that, which have been reflected in the political developments over the last uh, year and a bit, and Brexit and, and, and the rise of populism more broadly. Um, and so what I think I want to do now is just quickly, I've already given you a sense, and you've had quite a lot of discussions over the last few days on some of the intellectual background which led to the founding of INET. Uh, let me just say that what was that it was set up to facilitate a critical inquiry to broaden and accelerate the development of new economic thinking. In particular, uh, we wanted to uh, especially sort of draw attention to the, to the conceptual foundations aspect, the method methodological aspects, you know, engaging with experiments and big data. So in some sense at the heart of the discipline and evolving discipline. And uh, there was a clear sense that we needed to bridge the, uh, you know, the, the, the boundaries uh, with cognitive disciplines, including history, economic history, but also sociology, computer science, um, and mathematics. So we set up this institute in 2012 uh, with a grant. So this slide gives, goes through some uh, sort of more numbers, if you like. Uh, just, I just want to bring out a key element from this slide, which is that it was really an alliance between Cambridge, uh, different parts of Cambridge and INET New York. So it, in fact, this initiative got different parts of Cambridge to work together. Uh, so that was, I think, a major uh, thing going forward. And I'm pleased to report that uh, INET has renewed this initial grant in 2017, which is this year, for a further three years. So, so, so I think, you know, we are, uh, I take that as a, um, as a signal that I think we are very happy and INET New York feels that this is how. So let me just draw out a bit what the, the themes were and, and I, I'm, I'm conscious I'm running out of time so this is going to go a little faster now. There are four themes and you, one thing I want to get across is that you, if you, let's say we focus on the first one, networks, crowds and markets, you can see that there is, it, it, it could bring in um, you know, microeconomics, it could bring in, um, you know, macro, it could bring in econometrics, and that's what uh, it has done, in fact. And, and that's true for some of the other themes, like, for instance, empirical analysis of financial markets, it brings finance and econometrics and big data together. So let me, just to sort of flag one of the, so I'm going to go through three outcomes in this talk. So the first one is world-class research. Um, and uh, I, I will talk a little bit about the first theme, networks, crowds, and markets. So what's distinctive about this theme is that it is, it's conceptually innovative. It bridges micro and macro through sort of large networks. Uh, and it's methodologically innovative. It has theory, but it also has experiments, and it has big data, uh, network data, let's say production networks of the economy, supply chains, um, big sort of social network data. Um, and it engages very closely with sociology, computer science, and mathematics. So it's, it's uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good sort of an example of how Cambridge Janet works. It has brought together 
uh, a group of people, Vasco and Macro, Matt Elliott, who's doing micro theory, Eduardo, who does experiments, uh, myself, who mo who's mo more of a theorist, and Kaivan Munshi, who does community networks in developing countries. And it has led to a repositioning of key ideas, uh, key challenges thrown up by the uh, INET, and has led to frontier work at the heart of the discipline. So in some sense, we are engaging in what I think of as a challenge posed by the crisis and as articulated by the missions of INET. Uh, the, this is a sort of world leading group and there's some more data on that in the, in the slide. And I have about a minute left, so I'm going to rush through a little bit. So one feature of this initiative, one feature of this collaboration has been um, an attempt to be very inclusive, very broad. So the Cambridge INET has um, 10 leading sort of people in the institute, which seems like a lot of people, but it means that 10 out of the 12 professors in the faculty are key members of INET. And therefore, um, in terms of personnel, Cambridge INET has had fundamental and sort of profound influence on the way the faculty works, and it has raised the game for the faculty uh, dramatically. And so in a sense, it's been transformational um, of, you know, this initiative coming six, six years ago really, has really had a first order impact on the functioning of one of the world's oldest and most distinguished faculties of economics. And this is what, just to, I have 10 seconds left, I just want to flag that we ranked, we were doing poorly uh, through the uh, first 10 years of this century, and now we were ranked second in the, in, in, in the, US, in, in the UK. And we've also then, motivated by research and engagement with INET, we've introduced a number of innovations in our famous tripos, the economics tripos. And I'm going to, this is going to be taken up, this is a theme that's going to be taken up by Pontus later in this forum. Uh, but we've introduced a number of courses and some of them I'm mentioning here on these slides. So it's research initiatives, but also feeding into uh, training the next generation of economists. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Sanjeev. I'm now going to turn it over to the current, the second director of Cambridge INET, uh, Giancarlo Corsetti, whom you already uh, heard a bit of on the uh, context of the Euro crisis, but this is now uh, sort of standing back to uh, a, a, a demonstration of what Cambridge INET has been up to. Is it? Oh, thank, you. thank you, Bill. So I guess uh, I'm going to go a little bit more in, in depth very quickly because I understand that this is a substitute for your cocktails before dinner uh, uh, on the, some of the highlight of uh, uh, Cambridge Inet. So the, um, uh, you know, in a way, w when we started this idea, we had this, this view that crises are moments in which things become more open. So questions that we didn't know would come up. Uh, ways to look at things. Then, you know, in, in a way, it's actually a little bit more, more uh, you know, the, the more we work in, the more we are sort of uh, opening. Uh, few, I just listed a few things that uh, students come to me to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, and you recognize things that you would like to work on. Uh, some of them we can cover, some of them we don't have the strength to do it. But all I'm saying is that uh, Cambridge Inet uh, has sort of this role of uh, opening up uh, economics uh, everywhere, but especially in Cambridge. And the way we thought it would be a good way to go is the idea that there are policy questions, there is evidence, there is data. And this is what we are sort of pushing our students to work with. Uh, to, uh, some, some of them are more theory-oriented, theory some of them are more empirical-oriented, also the faculty, the same thing. So the idea is basically to let our research to be driven by relevant uh, issues. And uh, of course, helps to have more computing power, uh, but it also uh, adds, helps to have a little bit of humility and know that there are questions that we basically only starting to scratch the surface. And in a way, I think there is also a question that we should be asking and we don't ask yet. And this is where I think it's a little bit the, the challenge. So I, my, my view of, of Cambridge Anet is a little bit like this. So we, we, we just cast a net. And we would like, uh, now you're asking which kind of fish we would like to get, young fish. 
people with energy, people with ideas, people who can get uh, uh, on working. So what I'm going to do in two, three minutes, no, no longer, I just want to highlight, uh, this, is, this was not direct research. We didn't ask people to do this. We pick up a little bit people with some interest, but uh, they, in, in the uh, team, they look at economic policy transmission, we have uh, progress in two of the fundamental uh, research line in Cambridge, if you look at the classical Cambridge in the heyday. One is the multiplier. I leave Pontus to tell you more, because it's like a, a re rethinking the multiplier in a different context, context. And the other one is basically theory of production networks. And theory of production networks that was there in Cambridge, with, uh, as a long tradition, it is something that we are pushing not only in terms of uh, uh, diffusion of uh, um, shocks or uh, um, economic activity fluctuation, but also in terms of medium-term growth, diffusion of innovation, how uh, firms can uh, invest. There are, there are like uh, complementarities in investing. And the, the picture that you show, those, those two pictures to the right are from Vasco Carvalho work. Uh, Vasco has, has worked a lot on things like uh, the effect of the earthquake in uh, Fukushima on the supply chain, but the one on top is actually even more interesting, which is how production network uh, make uh, innovations diffuse across uh, economies by, via links, vertical links among firms. Um, theory, empirics. Uh, I, this is like, I just put th three students, I am, um, I, I did it randomly because there are many more, and I didn't want to, two of them actually I know. Uh, so one is, you may know that Yun Sun Shin has been talking a lot about balance sheet uh, economics, and uh, Jasmine now graduated in Notre, working in Notre Dame. He, she uncovered a very important aspect of the crisis, uh, which is the fact that firms that were pushed out of banking, uh, those who could issue corporate debt, went into corporate debt, but at the same time increase a lot cash holding for precautionary saving. And the reason to go into cash holding is because, you know, market debt is less restructurable. No? Markets are more difficult to deal with in the case of the downturn. So there is a natural tendency of firms to increase cash holding. This actually has an enormous empirical counterpart. I, I open up in the way Jasmine did the work a very beautiful dynamic model of firms' entry and exit. Anil Ari retop bank runs with a model that is actually has a beautiful historical application. He's working now in history of bank runs in, uh, in, uh, in the US. And Julien Gagnon with Sanjeev wrote, actually this was the opening paper in the American Economic Review on the network markets and inequality addressing the uh, you know, fundamental theoretical work on the fact that there is a social context for markets that need to be uh, understood you know, and brought to, 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 to bear about the empirical, you know, uh, how, how we interpret these inequality trends that we see. Uh, I have, um, uh, there is a very strong uh, uh, financial market group, uh, very applied in constant, talk, in constant contact with regulators. Uh, uh, this is led by Oliver Linton. Uh, with a lot of work on fat tails, a lot of work on crisis, a lot of work on uh, 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 frequency trading. Uh, th there is a tradition on uh, uh, the role of saving. So if you actually look at, at many of our work, many, many of the works we do, it, it, it amounts to a reflection not only on what drives excess saving, but also how come this excess saving do not go into spending, do not go into investment. So there is, when we say trans transmission mechanism was a horrible name for a team, but this ex that's exactly the point of transmission mechanism. What, what is this misallocation that may create uh, impediment to, to full employment? Uh, again, uh, Sanjeev, I, I repeat because uh, he, he likes to be. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fundamental work on networks and market. And I, I start with a picture of a face. Uh, Syria, the, the Syria that uh, did, um, it, it, she's really positioned herself as one of the world leaders on rethinking economics or religion. And we had a wonderful uh, um, uh, international top class meeting. We'll do it again 
she's writing books and, and you know, many articles on the, the, the idea. So those are the phases of uh, Cambridge Island. I invite you to, to look actually at the, um, uh, our uh, annual report. Uh, uh, we are planning to do a, a bigger one because now we are five years old. So just to, to, have, uh, to give a sense of uh, what we are doing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I am done. Good. Now, Professor uh, uh, Pontus Rundahl is a reader in the faculty. He uh, is, uh, represents a, new, a, a younger generation uh, coming in. And he's also just become director of teaching for the faculty, which, as you'll hear, is a, is a really strategic role. So thank you very much for inviting me to the conference. And thank you, Bill, for introducing. So I'm here mainly as a case study, as one of the people in the trenches in uh, Cambridge Island and contributing. Uh, my name was mentioned in, in one of Giancarlo's slides. Um, money doesn't buy articles. Maybe it can buy articles. But it doesn't buy good research. But what resources can do is it can provide you with a very conducive environment where research can flourish. And this is what I have seen um, being, no, I was young when I started. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, but what I've seen in the past six years being part of Cambridge and being part of Cambridge INET. Um, what we have is a research environment in which we have um, constantly a steady flow of postdoctoral researchers. These are normally individuals that have just finished their PhD, come in with fresh ideas and energy into our department and contribute to the research environment. Uh, we have a stream of visitors, um, which can be high profile uh, academics from various places um, um, in the world. We have even spoken to some today if they would like to be an INET visitor at the University of Cambridge. And again, this creates a very vibrant um, environment for us to work in. Uh, and it also gives us um, tremendous opportunities of organizing conferences on the precise themes that we're interested in. So we can bring in, uh, for instance, under the umbrella of networks, experts around the world uh, that can uh, jointly with us uh, talk about the challenges in that field. And so, so this, while you can't buy good research, you can, you can set up the environment in the right way such that we get it done. And I think what has made Cambridge, and this is something that Sanjeev touched upon a little bit before, is um, we have not, um, Cambridge has always been a bit of a rebellious place. So we address the questions we want and then we try to bring attention to them by publishing, publishing articles in high-end journals. So it's, we're not trying to play a game in which we do what journals like to see, but we're trying to bring attention to our ideas by going to the big journals and publishing there, and we have successfully done so. Um, one, one case in point that uh, I can, uh, you know, unashamedly speak about my own paper was thinking about to which extent can fiscal policy be a, an effective tool in combating a, a recession. And of course, we have the Keynesian idea of this, exactly how it would work. Um, but from a mainstream economic perspective, or, or somewhat on, on uh, neoclassical economic perspective, an idea like Ricardian equivalence shot that powerful amplification mechanism uh, to the ground. Um, and and in, in, a, in a famous article, um, Paul Krugman brought up in 1998 that the fiscal multiplier can be in a liquidity trap. It can be at most one. And it's bounded by one because you can never encourage spending by the private sector when you increase government spending in a perfect foresight or rational expectations optimization framework. And the reason is that agents, if you are familiar with the permanent income hypothesis, individuals spend out of increases in permanent income, not out of increases in temporary or transitory 
income. And if the, if the government increases spending with, say, 100 bucks, it will increase income by 100 bucks, but you will also need to increase taxation with 100 bucks. And that means that the private sector wouldn't be richer. Now, of course, you can argue here that instead of increasing taxation, you issue debt and you, you debt finance your government spending instead. However, debt is isomorphic to future taxes and in a forward-looking environment, that means that your net present value income has not changed. So what I, we, and, and that, that means that you put, you put a lid on how effective government spending can be just by having this, these optimizing forward-looking agents. What I just brought to that simple uh, story, I, I mean, there are many reasons the exact assumptions underlying that results may not hold. Um, some of them can point to a more effective role of government spending, but some of them can point to a less effective role of government spending. For instance, if taxes are distortionary and an increase in future taxes means increases in future distortions. Um, I wanted to bring up a point, I wanted to address this in a way that maintained perhaps these highly simplistic assumptions, but still could show that fiscal policy can be very important in combating a deep recession. And what I did was an introduction of, of a more realistic labor market into that framework. And I said, income is not only day laborers working for, say, monthly income. Income comes from jobs. And jobs, as we know in the data, last. And if we look at the theoretical literature, uh, the way how we model jobs is normally through search and matching frameworks where they also last. So if you then increase government spending and you give individuals 100 bucks in additional income, but the 100 bucks is associated with a job, even if you tax the 100 bucks as well, you're still richer because tomorrow you will still have the job and the government will not tax. And that will force you or force you, it will encourage you to increase your spending already today. So that was the source of the paper, very simple idea, but basically Ricardian equivalence holds, it's irrelevant, you can have a very, very powerful effect of government spending since an increase in income tends to be associated with, it, with increases in the number of jobs. So that's a, that's a case in point of the type of research we're doing. It's, some of it is old but classic questions that we try to embed in a, 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 or address in a modern way. Um, the last thing I want to say uh, is going into the type of changes we made to the curriculum in, in the last um, four years, uh, soon. Um, we have, I mean, partly to address what has happened during the financial crisis, uh, partly from our own ideas, partly from student pressure, um, we have made a, a, a number of changes to the curriculum. One is to introduce uh, much more history uh, of economics and history of economic thought. So we introduced um, two new courses, one in the history of economic thought, one in political economics, and we will introduce a third new course on history of economic growth next academic year. We have the previous director of studies, uh, uh, sorry, director of teaching, uh, have meticulously gone through slide by slide for, by each professor or lecturer uh, at the Faculty of Economics, ensuring that uh, we have relevant examples, real world anecdotes, data, and so on. So bringing the teaching up to where the frontier of research is. Um, uh, lastly, I took over a, a, a course from from a, a retiring faculty member last year. It was, it's called Applied Macroeconomics. Sometimes, you, isn't the expression that science progresses one funeral at a time? <laughs> um, I suppose some curriculum updates also progresses in a similar way. Um, and, and I wanted to bring in everything we have learned in macroeconomics since the financial crisis, which is, what happens with macroeconomic policy recommendations when we're in a, a zero interest environment? Um, so I, I fully modernized that course and 
these things are very relevant for the students and they are very appreciated. And I think it's been a success. Thank you very much. And particularly, Pontus, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the approach you took to rethinking, revisiting the multiplier in this particular way, because um, as a student of Richard Kahn, the inventor of the multiplier, I, of course, not only read but virtually memorized the original paper, which is actually worked out in terms of employment, not in terms of nominal value of GDP. GDP didn't exist. The multiplier was precisely calculated in terms of the government cr created additional jobs. There would be more jobs created by those who had been put to work by the government. So it was actually done in real terms. And that's not, not generally known. So the, this idea was to give you a, a little bit of a picture of how Cambridge, uh, for three generations, from, from Alfred Marshall's Principles of Economics, in which, by the way, he proposed that the model, the analogy, the metaphor for economics, this was in 1890, the metaphor for economics should be drawn from biology, not from physics, from adaptation under competitive pressures. And this year, 127 years later, Andrew Lowe of MIT has just published his book, Adaptive Markets, which says that basically, from the marginalists through the great Paul Samuelson, we were taken down a road of thinking of physics as the source of metaphors for economics, which turned out to be, and this is Andrew Lowe's, Professor Lowe's words, a blind alley, and we should walk back out and discover biology and adaptation under competitive conditions to a world, a context that is evolving around us and to which we must adapt or die. And what thrills me as a returnee from my 35 year sabbatical to Cambridge is that Cambridge has not only not been dying, it has been adapting and thriving. And that is thanks to INET. And we all up here feel enormous gratitude and respect for the vision that originated in the consequences of 2008 and genuinely has contributed to 2008 and the Great Recession as the gift that keeps on giving to the discipline of economics. Thank you. We have some time for questions if anybody wants to raise one. Yes, we have one right here. Do we have a microphone? Floating around somewhere? Yeah, we have a microphone right here. Yeah, if you want to come up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kazem Falahati from uh, Glasgow, uh, Can Caledonia University. If someone was want to help you and contribute new ideas and uh, you know critique of uh, mainstream economic theory or come up with uh, ideas for a new paradigm for economics, which I really believe that we are at a point of you know um, requiring com you know there is compelling evidence for a paradigm shift in economics. How can we help you? Uh, you how how can we? Uh, communicate with you, help you, or join your conferences? A very simple question. I think the question was how can someone who wants to contribute to the kind of work and research and discussion going on in Cambridge, how can they connect? And I think the, the simple answer, uh, John Carlo showed you the INET website. Uh, there's a continuing flow of events, and it has uh, everyone here, their email is in the public domain on the website. You can write a note, propose a thought, see if there's a conference that you would like to participate in, and I think the doors are open. The other question is, uh, why don't we start a journal which uh, you know, uh, is open to challenges um, to the mainstream, and therefore, and, you know, in a very rigorous way, um, and, uh, 
publicize our ideas on that. Uh, th th that could be a possibility for, you know, um, uh, to consider. The, I, I, I will say there, there are an awful lot of journals. Uh, there, there are an there enormous are. range of journals. Yeah. My own answer to that is that, frankly, I don't think we need, we've had this conversation at INET, I don't think the world needs another journal. What I think it needs is the kind of persistent battering down the walls and doors of the established journals, which have been adapting. The, not just the Journal of Economic Perspectives, but the Journal of Economic Literature, and, the, uh, and even the American Economic Review has been publishing work that 10 years ago you, that you would never have found in it. Can I just add a quick, quick thing to that? But I, I actually think that um, the way to get proper attention is not to create your own journal and publish there. The way to, to generate attention is to actually aim for the mainstream journals. And added to that, I would say, if you, my experience with, with these journals is, if you show them something that explains the data better than something else, you will be published there. So they, you know, as long as you keep your eyes on, the date, on their data, uh, they are very, the, the, the profession, my experience is that the profession has become much more open. And, and it's become, I'm, I'm sorry, because we may have other questions, but uh, I think the other thing is that there is now, in fact, a very interesting review of across journals that the profession has become very substantially more empirical since 2008. In every sub-discipline, the proportion of articles that are actually addressing data rather than uh, replicating abstract models has increased very substantially, and that's a really good thing. The world has come back into economics. Question there. Uh, Vinny Tafiro, University of Tampa. Uh, my question is about GDP. And in crisis in 1934, we invented GDP as a metric, but the economy functioned on production long before the metric was created. Today, we have a crisis in social capital and social trust. Where's the metric to measure that so we can invest in social trust and invest in all the things that we're talking about, the humanization of the economy? Good question. Do you want to take it? Anyone want to take yeah, a shot, Sanjeev? So, um, I mean, as you are aware, um, social capital and ideas relating to social capital have been around for quite some time. And Robert Putnam and others have done you know, great work uh, relating social capital to governance, to politics. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's really happened over the last 10, 15 years uh, is, in fact, in economics, has been a growing awareness that um, the economy is not separate from society, but is in fact a lot of economic activity is embedded in social relationships and, and, and in turn affects the nature, the texture of social life. So one of the many interesting things that, ha that have happened in economics over the last two decades is a very big and very, very, very dynamic program, research program on social networks. And, um, and indeed, uh, you know, if, if you are inclined, you can go and look at some of the material that Giancarlo referred to, but more generally in economics, there's been quite a lot of interest in understanding how social relationships affect economic activity, and in particular, how social capital um, matters. But of course, another side to this is um, human motivation. So this is, we are in Edinburgh, and it's the city of David Hume, among others. And so the very nature of human motivation has been, is a subject that has been greatly studied by economists, both empirically but also theoretically, uh, the nature of altruism, uh, for instance, um, and social preferences. So, so both on the structural social network side, but also on the nature of human motivation, uh, there's been a lot of work on you know, nature of preferences, behavior. Uh, most of it, I think, very experimentally driven. Uh, and I think both of them should inform, I think, the kinds of questions that you were, uh, I think, 
uh, you're, you're raising. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but we can take it offline. Any other? Okay, one, one more question here, and we can all go get something to drink. We get closer to our question from Tim in the room. Uh, Tim Clavin, University of Warsaw. Uh, just a quickie, uh, talking about behavioral economics, I've noticed that there hasn't been a lot of mentioning of incorporating the behavioral term into economics. Uh, one could argue that possibly that behavioral economics is going to lead to a fundamental change in economic models in the future. How far are we, are we from uh, those, that fundamental change? How far away are we from Sa uh, Samuelson? I'm going to take this first very briefly because um, George Akerlof, the great George Akerlof, is here in the conference. I don't know if he's in the room right now. But I went back um, just last week and reread his Nobel Memorial Lecture of 2002, which is called Behavioral Macroeconomics. Get that? And which begins by referring to Keynes and the general theory as the first great work of behavioral macroeconomics in which aggregate performance of the economy is rooted in the uncertain knowledge, the incomplete information, the fears, and self-insurance, the paradox of thrift, uh, that is at the root of human behavior of people who are not rational, optimizing, intertemporally maximizing mechanical agents. And I'm, would, I think it is fair, I don't think it's a secret that Cambridge has had a chair created in behavioral economics and public policy, which the faculty has now been fulfilling. So I think the short answer to your question, and my colleagues may want to provide longer ones, is that, in a sense, we see you and we raise you. We agree completely with what you are proposing, that macroeconomics is in the process of being, in a sense, repositioned to be deeply related to the behavioral, to, this, to empirical understanding of the behavioral micro foundations. And uh, I just, I think I'd add one thing. Our colleague, Professor Hamid Saburian, a, a game theorist and who has been at Cambridge uh, his whole career, once said, um, I once heard him say that far from having macroeconomics that is consistent with artificial micro foundations, we should have micro foundations that are consistent with observable macro behavior. Oh, yeah, right. Let's see if I can add. If I can add something, uh, completely agree. There is, again, I, I would insist, be, as long as my tenure lasts in Cambridge Island, <laughs> that uh, we have the opportunity now actually to uh, combine ideas with evidence from experiment, from survey. We are funding survey sometimes uh, with uh, big data. And if you look into, there are many things that we didn't know. Uh, maybe you did, I, I didn't, but I mean, there is systematic evidence, for example, that uh, savings go up during crisis. Sure. Now, we, we have this idea that during a crisis, a downturn, people run down a little bit their asset to maintain. This is not what we observe. And there is now more and more evidence that have been done by people in Cambridge, UCL. Now. So what I'm saying is that the, I always think of this process now, a process with many hands, there is a, an empirical hand, there is a theoretical hand. Hopefully we'll have more and more, uh, uh, we, we, are not, we are not an enormous uh, uh, department. I would like to be three times the size <laughs> than we could. But I mean, it, it, it would be good to have, uh, uh, I guess this is consistent with the idea that we want to bring up questions that are important, to call attention on questions that are important. And uh, this is a, 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 a strategy that takes many layers. Uh, so I don't know whether you consider that behavioral, but I think the evidence on the increase in saving is pretty. And I just if I can, can uh, Pontus has been very uh, abstract in the, the um, 
simple description of this multiplier. But this work is having an, an enormous impact on uh, uh, policy. Central bankers are now more and more going into uh, looking at uh, distribution, disaggregation. Uh, from time to time, I participate in this meeting of central bankers. And, you know, the, the uh, agent-based model now is becoming <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a new toy in central bankers' uh, uh, um, universe of tools. So um, uh, what Pontus did and people started to, to do at the, you know, together with Pontus or later, uh, it, it's really this idea of the Keynesian's multiplier more embedded in uh, employment security, in employment. Uh, and the, uh, the poster child, I have, I'm afraid, is Germany there. Because if you think of Germany in 2008, what they did, they avoided the, the dissolution of firms. They, they try, they, they send people on vacation, they send you know, they, this yep. recontracting. Uh, uh, so people did not lose their job. They lose part of the money, but not their job. Okay. And that was a, a big thing. Then it was a little bit of luck because China started to pick up and they could export to everything to China. But uh, the, the strategy is, is, is a different strategy to think about multiplier effects of spending. Not going into spending in the future to raise inflation, like you know mo most of the new Keynesian literature we say, which can be, can be a good things, but also think about spending related to the preservation of uh, production capacity. I should stop here because I'm really keeping everybody from. Is it, do you have? Yeah, um, Mike Joffe from Imperial College London. Um, I was very interested in your comments, <coughs> Professor Janeway, about biology as following Marshall as being a, a good metaphor or, or model for economics. Uh, I look like an old economist, but I'm not. I'm a young economist. I'm an old biologist. Yeah. I was a biologist before I went into economics. All I want to say is, it's not really a question, so I'm cheating a bit, is that there's been quite a lot of attempts to take ideas from biology, especially for evolution, into economics. And as a biologist, I'm quite critical of that because I understand quite well the causal processes in both and they're very different. And I think what's needed, the model, the biology is a better model for the methodology of how to take, as members of the panel have said, and many people in this conference would agree with, how to take evidence of diverse sorts and make theory out of it. So we don't have to start from the same old formalized, right. simple, standard theory. We create theory from the evidence. And that's um, something I, that I, don't, I see tendencies right. towards, but I don't see a lot of it. Yeah. Well, I think there's more and more happening, and a good deal of it is happening at Cambridge. Thank you very much. I think we're completing this okay, session. Thank you.